Well, that was interesting, hearing production, hearing serious discussions of soil quality, because in this brave new future, unless we do something about our soils, there'll be no upping vegetable production. And I can remember the early, when I first started reading Farmers Weekly, the whole idea of mycorrhiza and taking care of our soils was seen as muck and magic, you know, those foolish, um, those foolish organic producers. Um, well, our next panel it comes with many pledges. It's shopping and eating at home. And this is going to be chaired by Adam Leyland, editor of The Grocer, the best trade magazine, I can say, in all sincerity, that you will ever read. He's an editor unafraid to mix radical voices into his business reporting. And the distinguished panel here represent retailers who control about 50% of the veg sold in the UK. And at some point, you will see their pledges, I hope, on the screen, plus more that Adam will share with us. Um, so, um, Adam, I will leave you the task of introducing your bright and starry panel. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, everyone. Let me start by getting some puns out of the way, because I know you like them. Where's the bell? Mm. Oh, bell peppers, there you go. Um, corny jokes, I should say. It's amazing how many we're going to get through. Amazing. I didn't get a ping for that. Uh, let me be roguish and say it's great to be here. Oh, but I wasn't allowed. Oh, I was allowed that. Okay. Uh, among friends. Among friends. <laughs> Veg-loving friends, of course. Anyway, look, this panel is all about retailers and manufacturers, what they have been doing, but also <coughs> what they will be doing in the future as a result of this Veg Summit. Each of our panelists I will introduce in turn who will announce their pledges, uh, and then we will ask them some questions and grill them. That's probably not a pun, but yeah. Um, we will grill them on a, a, a bit, um, but also we will celebrate them, let's face it, because it's important, this work that's going on, and they are volunteering this. Some people didn't volunteer pledges, um, so it's great to have them here making their pledges. Uh, this is a complicated business, food, uh, getting people to eat more veg. Uh, when you look at it, on the one hand, you see better and wider selection of fruit and veg than ever. You see cookbooks now, many more cookbooks, celebrating vegetarianism and simply vegetable cooking, like the likes of Otto Lenghi. Um, we see veg now appearing in smoothies regularly, hidden veg in brands. We have avocado and kale celebrated like almost mini celebrities. They are hot trends. <laughs> Uh, flexitarianism, which people talk about as, in terms of eating veg on certain days of the week. Flexitarianism has become a new word. Um, I don't think that was in the lexicon of, 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 of food a few years ago, sort of five, ten years ago. Uh, we have more vegans than ever, more vegetarians than ever. So what is the problem exactly? Um, I think it's sort of summed up in uh, this strange statistic from the latest issue of The Grocer, which looked at all the key major nutrients, and as it shows, um, we are overeating on pretty much all of them. Perhaps that's why we have this obesity problem. Sugar, obviously, everyone talks about that. Saturated fat, we are overeating saturated fat. Protein, this great white hope uh, that, that is protein that will fill us up for longer. Actually, we're overeating on that too. But uh, significantly, our intake of two of the key nutrients, fiber, is substantially below the recommended levels. It's about half the recommended levels. And even carbohydrate is below the recommended levels. Perhaps that's because we're not eating enough potatoes, I would venture. But certainly this does point to the suggestion that we're not eating as much um, veg as we should. And, and the question is, should we, what should we do about that? It's a, it's a very complicated, it's like peeling an onion, you might say, if you wanted another pun in there. Should we employ a carrot or a celery stick? That one's already been used. Can we be appeased by the pledges <laughs> of our eminent panel? Um, let us begin. <laughs> Nobody's used that one. Because we have some important pledges, and I'm going to start by hearing a couple of minutes, please, from Emma Byrne at Lidl, 
who has some important announcements. But although she has leaked a few of them via her Twitter channel already. <laughs> I noticed on the board over there. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity to um, thank everybody for giving us the chance to put our onions together um, to come up with some um, great pledges um, from Lidl's perspective. We've really worked across the department. So to be in a room full of people that love vegetables as much as I do has me thrilled from my head to my toes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but fresh produce has always been a massive focus for us at Lidl. Um, over the years that I've worked there, we've increased our capacity by more than 50%, um, which has allowed us to increase our range by a similar thing. So you could say that we provide as much room as possible to um, vegetables. Uh, but moving on to the pledges, um, across departmentally, we've really worked together to come up with 10 commitments as part of our pledge. Um, as head of fresh produce, I'd like to sort of focus upon the ones um, that are very close to my heart. So um, beginning with our fun size range. So this is basically a project that we started uh, at the start of this year, which was in to incorporate and introduce vegetables into our Oakland's fun size, which is aimed specifically at children. So using playful characters, nice names, um, we've really tried to engage our um, customers, particularly their children, um, in maybe trying products that they wouldn't usually eat. Um, and really kind of trying to inspire parents to help them along the journey um, to help their children eat, eat well. We really do feel that if we can tackle um, fresh produce consumption at an early age, this is then definitely a um, habit that will continue into adulthood. So as part of our um, pledge, we're really committed um, to this range. This is something that we want to continue with. We've trialled it this year, and we'd love the industry to, to take up on that as well. The feedback that we've had from our customer base has been exceptionally positive and we really feel that this is, this is a fantastic focus for us, but hopefully for the industry. Um, as part of our uh, pick of the week, which is four items that we promote on a weekly basis, um, we're committed to incorporating as much vegetable as possible into those lines. Um, this is really a great opportunity where um, we work with our supply base to, um, to use overproductions, to push vegetables, to push fruit, um, and hopefully introduce items that perhaps our customers wouldn't try um, into their daily diet. So... Um, that's a really big part for us. We want to make sure that we incorporate at least six per month, um, but we're confident that we will, um, we will achieve far greater than that. Um, as a department, we're also working very closely with our social media um, teams. We want to really get our message out about um, vegetables to our customers. We're exceptionally passionate um, in our department about all of our vegetables, um, so we really want to work with them to make sure that we can get recipes, messages, as much as possible to... To have, um, to have our customers understand how they can be incorporating um, vegetables into their daily life. Um, we are also in the process of repositioning our vegetables to the front of our stores. Um, so that again, this is the focus from us as a British supermarket to make sure that we've got um, our fresh produce in the most prominent position for our customers. And finally, um, being part of the fresh produce department for the last 10 years, we work so closely with our supply chain, uh, with our suppliers, to come up with new and innovative products. So we really want to continue that as part of our pledge to make sure that we are doing everything we can um, as part of this commitment. Thank you very much. Our next pledge, we're going to hear them and then we can talk. Um, uh, our next pledge is from Alec at Sainsbury's. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely um, delighted to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, actually. Um, and um, I, I can see that, actually, this audience is pretty full. We haven't really got much room, but we've managed to squash as many people in as possible. Um, uh, and hopefully in my, um, in my pledge, you'll realise that I'm quite a fun guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, is that, that's not a vegetable, is that, it's a vegetable, isn't it? <laughs> are we going to have the debate about um, fungi? The mushrooms are fungi, so uh, you can see I'm very competitive. Um, okay, so um, that's enough of my puns. Uh, I'm not going to make any more puns, so anything that I say is unintentional from this point. Um, but I, I should start by saying that I'm actually not a nutritionist. Um, uh, like Tim, I'm actually a microbiologist by background. Um, but... <laughs> It's been interesting um, over the years that in the nutritional arena, um, what I've noticed is that um, most of the messages have been about what you should stop doing um, and, uh, or what you should um, uh, reduce eating, i.e. salt, sugar, fat, and clearly they're very good uh, messages. But I'm really excited because 
this is the opportunity to actually tell people we want them to eat more. Um, we want them to eat more vegetables. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted um, to uh, be one of the founding members and signatories uh, to the Peas Please pledge, be, um, pledge because we're absolutely um, uh, proud uh, to, um, to be offering customers healthy, nutritious products. And actually, we see this as a collective effort um, to actually increase the consumption of vegetables um, and actually make, uh, uh, hopefully, the nation um, uh, uh, live healthier lives. Um, so when it comes to um, our pledges, then, um, I've broken my pledge pledges into kind of four groups. And they've got a heading of S, A, G, and E. Now, the astute amongst you, very good, um, will recognise that, that that says um, uh, SAGE. Um, and just like Lord Krebs uh, raised, uh, there's as much contention about whether um, SAGE is a vegetable or not. But as far as I'm concerned, it's got roots, um, it's got a stem, um, it's got um, leaves, and it's edible. So it's a vegetable. Um, uh, so uh, ha having said that, it'll take quite a lot, about four packs to get one of your five a day. So I wouldn't suggest you might <laughs> smell nice, but um, uh, uh, that, that's about it. So uh, like I say, um, uh, pledges fall into four buckets. So S... Um, S is for sexy. Um, we absolutely have to make consuming vegetables something sexy to do. We have to create that um, desire um, that, um, that you can have um, with, with consuming products um, of that nature that historically haven't really been that appealing um, to customers. Um, we need to be more upbeat about veg. Um, and, and, and actually, I don't know whether you've seen... Oh, I didn't mean that one, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you, you. You've probably seen recently the um, milk tray advert coming back. What we need uh, to make vegetables more sexy is rather than that milk tray man parachuting in with a box of chocolates, we need him to parachute in with some courgettes or, or some um, boodles or courgette or, uh, or, or, or something. Now, I haven't got a, um, uh, a milk tray man, uh, but we can actually make things more um, appealing um, by um, putting vegetables on our landing page of our website, uh, making sure that it appears in the fresh, um, the fresh aisle on the um, website. Um, and, uh, and actually, um, I've got this here. I'm clicking on my website right now, um, and you'll actually see, um, if you click on the website, that uh, although there's lots of Halloween stuff on there, um, uh, there is a, a particular section about seasonal vegetables and you know, what's best in season. Um, and there's also a recipe for butternut squash soup um, on there um, uh, as, as we speak. So as well as, um, as, as, well as putting those things on the, uh, on the website, we can shout more about, um, you know, about uh, vegetables um, in uh, social media, with press, um, and I think that there's a lot more we can do to make products sexy. Um, having made them sexy, um, I think the, the, the A is about making them accessible, so you create the desire, and then you need to fulfill that desire um, uh, by putting veg in places that customers actually um, readily come across. Um, so it means high footfall areas, front of store. Um, it means putting produce on um, promotions, um, on the promotional plinth, um, on our inspirational plinths. Um, so these are all areas um, where we can fulfill um, the desire that we've created. Um, other areas we can look at are things like, and, and part of our pledge, um, is that any, all of our main recipe uh, meals on our website um, uh, will have two portions of veg in them. Um, and, and of course the other point about accessibility is it's not just for um, a certain um, part of the population. Um, there are disadvantaged parts of the population that perhaps um, uh, uh, under in index on one of your five a day um, and so it's also important to ensure that colleagues in our business um, actually um, encourage some of those customers to use their healthy start vouchers um, for purchasing fruit and vegetables um, and, and because I think living he healthier lives is about everyone not just the few um, the G um, I will get to the end of this soon Adam um, the, the, the G um, in our SAGE is for great product um, because actually it's through the development of products 
we can actually deliver um, what we want, which is increased veg. So putting them in product briefs, um, encouraging our developers to, um, uh, to increase the amount of vegetables um, in, in our new product development will significantly increase the number of products that we have one of the five a day, and we know one of the five a day is a key signal um, for consumers. And finally, the E is about education, um, and we've uh, um, heard that already. Um, and, and education isn't really part of the pledge, but that we, we also see it as, as absolutely essential that we encourage a healthy diet right from the start of life. And, and of course, the way we do that is through our um, Active Kids programme, um, and if you look online, some of the supporting materials for that, which we will continue to progress, um, uh, is, is a, a recipe dishes, recipe dishes with fruit, with vegetables, where we can actually encourage their consumption at a very early stage of their lives. So, um, in summary, we're absolutely committed um, to living up to the pledges that we've made today. Um, uh, because you know, it makes sense for our business, it makes sense for our customers, and we really want everyone to be living uh, healthier lives by consuming all veg. Thank you very much, Alec. I was going to say to you, you need to button it, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you just about got in there uh, before I stopped you. Um, our next uh, speaker is pledging from Mars. His name is Chris Dugmore. Thank you, Thank you Adam. Um, with so many puns already made today, there's not much room to go anywhere else, so there's going to be some repetition. Um, I did have another pun, but someone beat me to it, so I'm just going just to get on with the pledges. Um, good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to be here. Um, Mars Food is committed to making everyday meals a little bit healthier. Um, we're really proud to be here on this panel today with some of our biggest customers. What really excites me, as well as the pledges we're making today, are exploring the areas of collaboration that we might have in the future as we all try and tackle this problem together. Um, every year in the UK, 450 million meals are cooked using Mars Food products, and our pledge is to help those people using our products to cook with, with more veg when they're making those meals. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we're pledging to update all of our on-pack and online recipes um, to encourage our consumers to add a little bit more veg every time they're cooking. This could be through the meal itself, so for example, adding mushrooms or courgettes to your spaghetti bolognese, or through the vegetables that you serve on the side of a, a menu or side of a plate. For our food service customers, so we also have a catering business, we are in the process of developing a new recipe bank of recipes that contain two of your five a day per serving. And I was in the development kitchen yesterday watching the guys work on these new recipes. Um, and we will, through to 2018, promote this recipe bank with our food service and catering customers, showing them how easy it is to add more vegetables to the recipes that you're creating. Um, and it doesn't stop there. We're also encouraging our staff to get involved and make it easier for our staff to eat more vegetables. So over the course of the coming months, we will be updating our menus that we serve in our food canteens to ensure that our associates have even more access to vegetables for the foods they eat at lunchtime at work as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, our next, it's well on track, fantastic. Um, our, our next uh, pledge is coming from Sharon at our kitchen on the Isle of Thanet. You remember Adam started this section by talking about the percentage. Sorry, can you hear me again? The voice is hoarse, but after a while your ear gets in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Adam started this section by talking about how large a, a proportion of the market we all served. Well, our percentage is absolutely tiny. <laughs> But don't write us off, because we think we've got a brilliant way forward. I'm not here by myself. Everybody who's got one of these on can help you. So we have our suppliers with us. We have our college with us. We have public health with us. We have our directors with us. And Martin, we have our researcher with us as well. We come together as a team. We're absolutely tiny, and we're on the Isle of Thanet. So our pledge is that this Friday afternoon, the 480 pieces of flapjack we sell will contain grated carrot and grated apple. Our risotto will contain 
pumpkin off the allotments locally. It can't go on, can it? We've all agreed that. In Thanet, the sale of ready meals is enormous and going up. And I'm not sure that the minister had it quite right. Um, I'm not enthused about the idea of tackling a cabbage on a regular basis. It is convenience. People are eating many more ready meals. So our ready meals are going to be made locally by local suppliers who will take who take their most popular dishes and make them more healthy. Our chickpea curry is going to have less ghee and less salt in it. So we are actually working with ready meals to introduce more vegetables and to make them more wholesome all round. But we're also tackling other barriers that are in their own subtle ways, preventing people eating more veg. Cost. The food miles have gone if you work really, really locally. If people are enthused and want to deliver for themselves, and our strap line is than it feeds itself better, that's a bit powerful, isn't it? Um, you can work with well-trained volunteers, and that helps too. Convenience. How's about public health help you out? And you can put display freezers in doctor's surgeries. Yeah? So we're getting, as a young woman said to me the other day, we are getting to them before they get to the shops. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Talking of convenience, our next speaker is Sukjit Kira, who runs a chain of, of convenience stores called Simply Fresh. Hi. Um, I don't know if many of you know about Simply Fresh, but we're a collection of independent stores run by independent retailers. Um, and we're quite a beat about our pledges. Um, the core pledges... <laughs> <laughs> our core pledges centre around promotion and ease for the consumer. Um, so promotion, we, we pledge to promote vegetables um, as um, on our social media platforms um, by doing regular monthly promotions and to let our uh, consumers know about what vegetables are in season and are available locally. Um, Ease, we will be looking at promote, uh, putting vegetables um, at key locations n near the entrance of our stores, um, incorporating them into our meal deals including our lunch meal deal, where currently we um, do a fruit um, option. We, we, we will be putting a veg, veg option as part of the meal, um, lunch meal deal as well. And um, we shall be include, make parceling up meals to include two, two vegetables, so it's easy for the consumer to buy into that. Short but sweet, fantastic. Uh, our, our final pledge comes from Tesco, Tim Smith. Thanks, Adam. Of all the things I expected to happen this morning, um, being outed by Alec as a microbiologist was not <laughs> top of my list. <laughs> There's quite a few people who know me and not, didn't know that. Um, we are, as you know, the nation's biggest greengrocer, so the till's ring in our stores about 79 million times a week, and it's pretty critical to us that we get behind this series of pledges and we own... The work that goes behind it. So I think as a start of a 10, just the scale that we bring to the pledge is sufficient, I think, to help us and our suppliers focus our attention. The real sort of centre of my kind of few minutes is, is on customers, though. So all of the retailers in the room will say the same thing in another way, but our customers, more than two-thirds of them, ask us to help them to lead healthier lives. So much of what we're doing is responding to those needs of that customer in, in 2017. 
And what they do is they identify the barriers to them eating more healthily. And obviously they're confused by what we do and what other people do. You missed it. Confused. <laughs> Sorry. There aren't going to be many. Um, but equally, that none of those barriers are specifically new. And you'll, I'll talk about price as a, as a key indicator in a moment. We, we find, like everybody else, that one of the biggest challenges working with our suppliers and with the marketeers who kind of help communicate messages is actually reconnecting the British population with its food sources. So John's company did a fantastic video which showed a group of customers how an onion is grown, where a mushroom comes from, what happens when a little gem lettuce is sown and how it's, how it's uh, harvested. And the lack of knowledge amongst our customer base means that we, we've lost the generation. We do need to reconnect young people, particularly with the food supply system. And that's part of the plan and part of our pledge to help people to eat more healthily. Anybody who devises a plan, whether the regulator, government, retailer, manufacturer, to help others eat more healthily has to start with the consumption, increased consumption of fruit and veg. If you don't do that, you're kind of missing the point. So everything else we do, and, and Alec made reference to it, it's not about stopping or starting, it's about encouraging people to make those choices and move into the sort of fruit and veg area. Those few small changes that we see, and some of those are contained with our pledges, add up to a big difference. Because we're not talking about huge swings in behaviour, we're just talking about small incremental nudges towards the right themes and ideas. We can't do any of this without our suppliers, and connecting the supply base that we've got, the brilliant suppliers we have, to what customers are asking us to do to help them live more healthily is kind of the critical bit. And one of the first things that customer, our customers will tell us is that they want to eating more healthily to be affordable, which is why over a year ago we took the view that we should introduce a new range, an entirely new range of, of fresh produce and vegetables. And we were slightly hesitant about doing it because it felt like back to the future. But in fact, as we just reported in our numbers, 70% of our customers are now buying those products and putting them in the baskets every week. So it's possible by reducing price and either maintaining or improving quality to square the circle so that customers get more of what they're actually asking us to help them with and we as a retailer ring the tills as often. We've had to try and find new ways to connect people to fruit and veg and one of the ways we've done that is by trying new ways of looking at the same sort of product. So you will see cauliflower couscous, you'll see mushroom steaks, you'll see courgette, I think in pretty much all of the stores represented on stage. And all of those things are designed to help people to eat vegetables in a different way or to try new ones they might not have had before or perhaps even introduce kids to the world of veg. Our pledges are largely to do with product development. So for a while, most of my competitors know this to be true of Tesco, every time we've, we've relaunched or looked at a product, we've said to get back on the shelf, it has to be, it has to taste as good, has to be as good value, but it has also to be more healthy, which poses a big challenge for those guys and girls in our product development kitchens. It's really tough to do that but they're succeeding. So you'll see, as our ready meal range is revamped over the next couple of years, you'll see lots of introductions of more veg into those ready meals in a way that hasn't quite been there before. And you'll also see that when we promote, we're pledging that we'll always include, in our, main our meal deals, you'll also include veg as either a salad or as the veg itself. All of this links, and hopefully we'll get some questions on this, into food waste. And we kind of got a bit there in the first session, so I'm hoping that we'll get some questions that link eating healthily and the sustainability of the food waste that, that we all have to sort of juggle with at the same time. I'd encourage the Food Foundation to do one more thing and be a bit more forceful in its direction, and that is what gets measured gets done. 
And in food waste, what we found is if you set a target, if you measure it, you'll get a lot more action. So my encouragement is that we should all set targets and be measured against them. My final comment is that we're doing a bit of work at the moment with Sam Cass, who's Michelle Obama's uh, advisor on food. And I asked him what uh, Michelle Obama's favorite veg was, and not surprisingly, it's broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Is that your final payoff then? Yeah. It, oh, I see. It was, it was a gag to wrap it all up, I see. Um, thank you very much to you all um, uh, for your <coughs> pledges. I've got actually two more that I wanted to tell the, the, you all about because two other uh, retailers. Um, a retailer, a retailer and another big supplier um, contacted us with a pledge but couldn't be here, not least because there's no room on the stage. Um, it, the first is Co-op, uh, which is um, saying that we're going to pledge to include a weekly feature on our social media uh, of, of vegetables and advertise at least one seasonal vegetable in our magazine, online and on our social media every month. We will promote Peas Please specifically to our customers and indicate which cooking sources include one of your five a day where possible? We will put vegetables at the top of the agenda when planning retail new product design across all our food categories. And we will increase veg options in our lunchtime meal deals. So that's the co-op. The other is Nestle, the world's largest food and drink supplier. We pledge to update all of our retail Maggie dry recipe mix, stock cube and stock pot meal recommendations to include at least two portions of vegetables per serving on pack and online by the end of 2018. This will encourage three million people who buy these Maggie products every year to eat more veg. So those are the two final pledges. So first of all, let me see if there are any hands for people to ask questions to our panelists. Lady over there, do we have a microphone to get over there? To her, right at the very front, with the grey jacket. Yes, hi. Um, I'd just like to ask the, the retailers uh, on stage, um, thank you very much for your pledges, they're fantastic. Um, when I go into my local supermarket um, and I've got in mind to eat more veg, uh, I'm not a vegan, but I go in and I say, have you got any vegan sandwiches or um, are there any vegan ready meals? Because I don't want to eat meat that day. Um, and the staff say bacon or egg, <laughs> not necessarily vegan. <laughs> and um, it's just a quick word to try and quickly, because I'm in a hurry, try and quickly find what I'm looking for. Um, and I'm just wondering if um, the retailers would consider um, or maybe they do already, um, but to consider the staff education on why we're doing this and um, uh, just at the right down to the customer interaction at store level um, because we don't, I don't see a lot of that and I think that's an um, important part of the, the whole thing. I... Yes, go with Sharon, she's a retailer. <laughs> yes, and amongst a lot of other things as well in this company. Um, I'm not sure that in Thanet that divide between customer and producer is going to be so clear. We will be working in the company and other and buying from it. I think there's a whole load of education to do across society. And if we don't think of ourselves as customers and makers, but people who do all of that, yes, and we just know our our food is so local, you know it in a way that you don't know it when it's come from a factory, on a pallet, on a motorway, been repalletized, and come into a store warehouse. You know Roshan Ara, you know her restaurant, you know you've walked past it, it's your area. And I think that, I think local, 
brings a knowledge and an understanding that we just haven't got at the moment. Let me broaden it then to the, the big retailers. You don't have that ability to have that yeah. locality. You've got people coming in, coming out. Is there any training for your staff? Uh, if I could just start with Emma. Is there training for the staff on the shop floor in vegetables and veganism and so forth? Or is perhaps the answer to have branded ranges? To develop, we, we have all these ranges that the supermarkets invent to help the shopper, but is there a scope for specific ranges for vegans, or is it just a matter of a little label that sort of says vegan friendly? I, I think that the, the question posed um, poses a sort of wider question about education generally um, of our sort of youngsters and customers. Um, we try and communicate as best we can with our freshness coordinators, which we have in store, who are specifically there to deal with the fresh produce. Um, but, you know, I think what is, is somewhat lacking, perhaps, is the knowledge of seasonality, is the knowledge of, of what can be done with fresh produce, is perhaps then the knowledge of what veganism is. So I think it, it really is a sort of a wider question um, of education generally, such that people understand, um, you know, if you're going into store and asking that, that people do understand that generally, and that shouldn't be too much to, you know, to ask. It is quite frightening to think, though, that we, we hear about children thinking that pasta grows on trees, but the idea that bacon and egg are somehow vegan products, is, every bit is frightening. Does anybody have any specific training on, as a retailer around veganism? Ali? Um, I, I wouldn't say we have specific training around ve veganism. I, I think that, as, as you said already, um, Adam, um, there's a large number of colleagues. We have 195,000 colleagues. Um, uh, we, the, the way we engage them is, is a bit similar to what I talked about in terms of the, the sexy element, the S element. Um, so when we launch products, we have something called Yama. Um, I'm sure many of you use that. Um, we, we talk about those new products. We recently launched a vegan sandwich, um, and we, you know, we talk about those products so that our colleagues understand. You know, but, but we're talking about it in the context of newness and excitement and get them engaged in, in, in that way. And actually, th th that sandwich, interestingly... 40% um, uh, of the customers aren't, aren't vegan who buy that, that sandwich. So actually, it's a big success um, in, in the market, let alone just for vegans. Um, yeah, if I might, I think the, the, the issue that we all face as, as kind of retailers to the mass market is partly addressed by what Alex just said, and that, that we call that our inside-out approach. So that means that colleagues know as much as they possibly can about the ranges, particularly if they're changing, particularly if there's something new and different. But none of us are doing a good enough job helping customers to navigate to areas of the store and to specific parts of the store where they know they will find the healthier choices. So when we had our healthy month in May, we tried to change that. We tried to help and guide people in a way that meant they were specifically heading in, in those directions. And labels. they the actual on-pack label, there's lots of technology now that will help us with that, with those specific needs, but we don't want to make this a ghetto. There's no reason why vegetarian or vegan products should, should be stigmatised in any way. Uh, most of the retailers make them part of their mainstream range, and it's just a question of finding the right navigation tools. So it's a combination of educating our, our colleagues as much as we possibly can, keeping them up to date, enthusing them, I'll steal Alex's idea, that's absolutely right, but also then providing hard navigation and labels for when people might not be as available to help out as customers would want. Can I ask a question to Chris about um, your, your pledges? Because when I think of Mars food, you know, there's lots of veg and dolmio pasta sauces typically, uh, mostly tomato, but peppers and so forth. So you're already hiding those veg, those veg effectively in your product. It's not meat products. But you made a specific pledge last year around um, not encouraging people to consume some of your products as often as they, should, as they might. It was a very brave step. I wonder what sort of response that had amongst consumers in terms of behavior, and whether you've achieved what you'd like from that previous pledge hmm. and how this one takes it forward. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of our, Adam, as you say, lots of our products do contain um, lots of veg. So I think in this context, let's call a tomato a vegetable, not a fruit. Um, all of our tomato-based um, products contain one of your five a day per serving. So um, already, you know, lots of, lots of health credentials within there. Um, the response last year to our um, announcement around uh, consumption uh, was broadly very positive from our consumers and from our stakeholders. In fact, it's when we first started talking to the team here at the Food Foundation. It started with a simple belief from us, actually, that we want consumers and we want um, people using our products to think about their meal in total rather than the product as, uh, in isolation. And so when you look at those meals that people are cooking with our products, we said, Do you know what? you probably want to eat a lasagna a little bit less often than you want to eat a spaghetti bolognese when you look at the nutritional profile of it. And so around 5% of our product portfolio, we said, probably shouldn't be something that you eat every day, maybe more of a balanced weekly. I think it was a very brave step for us to take. We got some uh, headlines that were not so favorable. Um, have we achieved what we wanted? No. Uh, it was a 2021 commitment. We're starting to see that labelling come through onto our products and onto our websites now. Um, for us, it's all about helping educate our consumers. What should they be eating every day? What should they be eating as part of a balanced weekly diet? Um, the, the real story, and I think the real impact, is the nutrition criteria that underpins that announcement. Um, that influences our product reformulation, influences the new products that we develop. So this year we launched no added sugar variants of our Bolmio, uh, Dolmio Bolognese recipes, no added sugar pasta sauces, as well as some chicken recipes that include one of your five a day when cooked in the cooking instructions. Um, and we've recently updated that criteria with some nutrients to enhance where we're uh, challenging ourselves to increase the number of whole grains, legumes and vegetables in our products. Um, so I think it's all part of the same journey about making our products that little bit healthier and encouraging our consumers to eat healthier every day. Okay. Uh, lady on the left of you two, please. Oh, no, this one here? Yeah, go on. It's a wonderful echo chamber in here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Iris from the New Citizenship Project. Um, so we've done a lot of work on the priming effect of the consumer language. Um, and what our research shows is that when we use the language of the consumer, we're priming people to care less and we're limiting people's agency to just choosing. So um, when we think of people differently, when we think of people as citizens, we suddenly start thinking, okay, how can we all shape the system, not just choose um, amongst products and services? So my question to you is, how, what, what are you doing that um, kind of um, brings out more of our capabilities and agencies? Because I think we can all agree, we're more than consumers, we can do more than just choose. So what, what is it where we can shape the choice um, and what, what's your role in this and how, how are you doing this? Thank you. So, Jeet? Yeah, um, Simply Fresh, we champion more um, dietary specific um, products, uh, vegan products, um, to help uh, the consumers make that choice um, uh, for um, wellness. Um, we also promote a lot of um, cooking from scratch, so you know, vegetables are the core of that. Um, hi, Arti Ramchandran from the FAIR Initiative. Uh, thank you for all your pledges. Um, you, I mean, we saw a start earlier which showed that there's a clear discrepancy between the current composition of customer baskets and what they should be buying. So I'm curious, and Tim, you specifically mentioned the need for measurement, um, and I'm curious about what you're all doing from a data perspective, what data you're tracking to, to see that your pledges indeed, um, you know, push such a shift or enable such a shift in, in uh, customer baskets? Uh, yeah, so I, I didn't prime that question, but it, it allows me to say one thing. That is that we have used our data collection methods um, to determine how healthy the baskets of our customers are wherever they shop on a compu completely anonymized basis. And we do that so that we can see, and they are getting healthier, the baskets of shoppers within our stores. It changes by size of uh, basket, it changes by type of store, it changes by age group. But all of those criteria applied, 
the baskets of our shoppers are actually getting healthier and have done for the last three years. Now, the trick, I think, and it links to your kind of point about priming in some ways, the trick is to find a method which isn't nanny state, which isn't kind of wagging the finger, to help those customers who actually want to know what they might do that they're not doing now, just to make that slight change, that difference that would mean that their basket score was even healthier than the one they had previously. Because it's only those little helps, those little differences that are going to make the difference. It's, we're not going to swing people from one form of diet to another. Um, that's not our aim. Our aim is to help them in a way by providing the information to allow them to make the choices. So the data is really important. And the extent to which that is pre-competitive, I'll let others judge. But that's one of the great benefits of the Food Foundation. If they do the work, if they can do what the NDNS did for salt and what the FSA did in John's time and others on sat fat and sugars, then the role of, of all of us becomes easier because we're using metrics that we don't really want to argue about. They're just there. Okay. Gentlemen, back with the glasses. Hi, uh, it's a question here for Tim and Alec. Um, you guys run phenomenally successful loyalty schemes in Club Card and Nectar. Uh, and having worked with them, I, I, I would say they're probably the two most influential instruments of the nation's diet that there is above everything. Yet the number of promotions that you run those schemes for fresh vegetables is, is almost, you know, it's, it's just tiny. Could we possibly get a pledge off you today that you will increase the amount of vegetable promotions you're running through your loyalty schemes? Yes. Done. Well, you do 10%, just to reflect what... Well, well <laughs> I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure we can actually say the, the, the percentage, but I think the, the key point, if you look at the pledges that we've made, is about increasing the number of products that are, that, 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 that are in the promotional space, whether that's online, whether that's um, in the store, on the promotional plinth, on the inspirational plinth. The key issue is that you will, when you go into um, one of our stores, you will see products being promoted on that line and it's in direct sight of the customer. Would you adjust your algorithms so that they appear in the top promotions so people get the vouchers in the post, they get them on their emails, they get them because your algorithm is pushed to the top the promotions are going to make you the most amount of money which is perfectly reasonable. But would you consider an override of those algorithms to make sure that people always get a fresh vegetable promotion within their sort of top five offers that are being made to them? We, 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 we can look at that but I can't pledge to that at the moment without actually understanding what that what that would be but um, picking up on that point in a, in a previous point um, what one one of the things that's really important here is understanding what the drivers are for customers uh, in terms of you know what is it that will make them more inclined um, to actually purchase product clearly price is, is one but we're doing some work with um, Oxford University and some other universities looking at what those key drivers are what are the key things that are going to um, motivate a customer um, to actually pick up that product and actually um, use more vegetables in their, in their, um, in their recipes. Uh, so we're pretty much, I think, going to be in the same boat that we want to find ways that work to affect consumption and not just purchase. And some of us appeared in front of the Select Committee recently talking about food waste. And one of the biggest drivers of food waste is the kind of distance you put between yourself and your customer when you're offering online, buy one, get one, freeze, or volume related. And not only does that cause resentment amongst the customer base, it causes massive amounts of food waste. So we've pretty much all stopped doing it. So it's finding an algorithm that actually has the outcome that you want, which is people to eat more fruit and veg, and doesn't result in a risk to food waste. So yes, we're, we're working on it. I think that the, the answer on, on all, all of our marketing efforts is you're seeing a ramp up in the positioning and the kind of prominence given to both fruit and veg, and that will continue online, in store. Sharon. I just want to say that I know we're tiny, but think of it like this. In your area, are most of your kitchens empty most of the time? Have you got people who want more hours work? Yes? That's what we had. We have, are going to develop, we are developing a model 
that is going to be freely franchisable. Let's bring it home. Let's bring it out of the factories into our kitchens. Do you think, Sharon, that your idea, it's a great idea, do you think it is scalable? And if so, is anybody mobilising it at any level? Or will give, the a, food give us a chance, Adam. Um, <laughs> we're doing it. The essence is it's local. You trust your food. You maybe reduce the variety. It becomes seasonal. You know who made it. It will be we're sending our meals in vans out into our food desert. When I was a child, my mum used to get her fish from the van at the end of the road. People used to go down the road talking as they went. It was a social occasion. Do we really want to do all this by ourselves? It, I think sometimes shopping's a lonely experience, particularly if you're not sure you can pay the bill at the end. But we're not about poor food. We're about making wholesome food affordable locally. So it doesn't really matter how much money you've got at the moment. We think our meals are more wholesome, they're definitely more affordable, and you can do it too. We're a tiny exemplar. It cut, you would you lose the essence of what we are about if you did it nationally. It's got to be our kitchen in Edinburgh, our kitchen in Belfast, our kitchen. We've got to own it for ourselves. Another question? Anna. One here. Sorry. <laughs> um, I wanted to pick up on, on Tim's challenge around metrics. Um, so we're going to have a session at the end of the day where we're talking about tracking, but you'll have seen at the beginning of this session we had this slide which Kantar very kindly helped us with to work out the proportion of our shopping baskets which are currently veg and the target, which the, the average at the moment is 7.2% and we want to get to 20%. So we've got a metric for the retailers, um, which will allow us to track progress in a positive direction. And I know for sure that two of the retailers that have committed today, two of the four, um, have, um, have said that they want to track that metric internally. Um, Tim, it would be brilliant if Tesco did likewise and tracked that, because we think that that could then start to be the sort of metric that you're talking about, which has some currency and which allows us to basically collectively monitor whether, whether things are moving in the right direction for the retail environment. Tim, are you going to say anything? <laughs> um, well, I just can't see anything wrong with uh, taking that approach, because, as I said earlier, what gets measured gets done. And in all of our product developers' minds, in all of our kind of range experts and all of our buyers' uh, psyche at the moment is how do we move from 7.2 to 20 or as near as we possibly can. So since it's part of their daily life these days, we may as well measure it because it will have more of an effect. Happy to do that. Gentlemen, in the blue sure, shirt. thank you. Um, I, I live in Wales, and 56% of our public budget is spent on fixing health. 30% of the rest is going to get spent on health in the next five years if we don't fix the system, going back to our opening. And what I'm hearing is some great incremental changes on a broken model, and not that much in terms of ambition. What I'd like to hear from the speakers is to say, if they could tap into the knowledge and networks in this room, what's the boldest thing they would set out to do about fixing the food system that it creates a healthy population? Because there's, there's, there's a need for step. We haven't got long, and there's not enough ambition. And I'd love to see it. If you couldn't fail, what would you set out to do? There's a, a challenge. <laughs> Emma, you haven't spoken for a while. Why didn't you have a go at that one? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know, it, it goes back to sort of the, the question that I did answer, um, not to sound like a broken record, but yes, we don't have a much time much time we really need to change people's attitudes to um to vegetables and i think that's something um that is clear to me from either my friends or, or people i know that 
vegetables have for too many years been the side dish, the, the, the side player, the sidekick, um, as opposed to um, the main meal. Now, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm happy to have multiple uh, vegetarian days, a week, whatever, um, but I, I eat the full food spectrum. But I think still vegetarianism, veganism, etc., are still seen as slightly odd, slightly left field, sort of not, not the way, um, not the sort of standard, if you like. So for me, it's, okay, it's perhaps not as brave as you're looking for, but to me, it is a grassroots sort of education that vegetables can be exciting, vegetables should be the main player, not as much meat on the plates in schools, not as much um, meat incorporated in um, sort of every aspect of food, be it that we've discussed uh, people vegetarian going out for dinners, um, you know, I really think vegetables need to become the main focus um, to change the mindsets of the youngsters um, and people alike that, that that's what we're really looking for is, is to eat vegetables and for them to be exciting. So that's where I see that it comes from. It's education on seasonality, on vegetables, on how they're grown, to really just have a shift change as to the way that we look at food at the moment. Can I just say something before I just talk to Alec, uh, get Alec to, to say something? And that is... As somebody who's incredibly engaged, I haven't figured out what my budget on vegetables, uh, it's a new badge of honour though, what it's going to be. I'll go and figure it out straight away after this, what it is. But uh, knowing I've got a, a kid who's eight years old and knowing all the pressure that we put him under, the things that we hide, try to sneak in all over the place, the, the level of resistance is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and to me, you know, this is the, the nature of the challenge, is the educational aspect and that's not something that supermarkets can do on their own or, or manufacturers because there's a fundamental educational bias against making food when you go all the supermarkets even little now is putting their fruit and veg right at the very front of the supermarket that we, yeah which is clearly good it's a halo <laughs> product for them you know they want people to shop that they make they put a lot of effort into making it look good but at the end of the day, a lot of people look at that and go, that's a bit daunting, and I haven't got a lot of time. I think I'll go to the ready meals area and, and do something there. So I think it, I think it is re really, really hard, and I think it's a great challenge that you've put to us, and one that you know, I couldn't frame better myself. But this is, the, this is the nature of the challenge, is the level of effort and the level of education of, 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 for schools, from a governmental point of view, I wish you'd asked that to the previous panel, as much as I... I'm glad that you asked it to this one. But Alec, what was your point? Well, I, actually, I was going to build on, on what both of you have said, because I, you know, if I had one thing I could do, it would be to connect um, the supply chain, to connect consumers with you know, how their products are made um, you know, and where they come from. I mean, fundamentally, if, if, if you know how much time, care and attention is put into um, growing crops, is put into producing products, one, you'll have a, a greater impact on reducing waste because you wouldn't want to waste that, that, that product. And two, you would encourage the consumption of the, of the right products because you start to connect um, you know, the, the, the end point with the start point. Do you think that price, there's not enough talk about price. We haven't really talked, one or two of you sort of mentioned it, touched on it. But do you think price could be the difference? Is price alone the, the silver bullet? To make, you know, to, in effect, to say that there's a tax that has to be applied from other some other categories that is then applied to reduce the cost of fruit and veg. I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I think it is part of the picture. I think convenience is really important too, and it's an awful lot easier to connect the top both ends of this if you're working locally. Sorry what? to hammer it home. Temp but when you sit down with your clinical commissioning group, your local public health, your local school meals, your college, when you all sit down together, that gets powerful in terms of food in that area. So number one um, on the list, and it is a list, is reconnecting citizens with the, their own diets. And Alex said it, another way. It's partly education, it's partly just that reconnection. So I encourage you, if John will lend you his video of how onions are shown to his group of, um, he's pulling a face. Um, 
But that is the sort of example where most adults will have not the faintest idea where mushrooms and, and onions come from in this country. As somebody who's done some work in public health before, I'd say, no, there isn't going to be a silver bullet. But right at the heart of the solution is the consumption of more fruit and veg. That's always going to be at the heart of it. And then if you talk to the experts, people who know much more about it than me, you'd have reformulation of product, you'd have portion size, you'd have navigation, you'd have price, and you'd have promotion. And all of those things together, you know, in a way, the trajectory is going in that direction now, but all of those things are absolutely vital, and none of them on their own are going to work. It's interesting to me that part of the key part of the success of the discounters in the last five years has been their focus on fresh produce as a driver of traffic. Previously, it was said it couldn't be done. It was all about 24 packs of Stella, and it was all about chickens at incredibly cheap prices. It was all about possibly about bananas as a footfall driver. But fundamentally, fruit and veg was an area of for margin as much as anything. And what you and Aldi have done is really put the focus on the halo effect on the super sixes, as, they, as, the, as your rivals call them, and all these really, really cheap products. And the supermarkets have responded. So there's a part of me that feels as though kind of the work has been done by retailers with the pledges they've already made, as much as the pledges they will make, that there's this real pressure on, on, on pricing, on fresh produce, more than any other area. So I feel as though that's... Um, you know, there's some real momentum building, and I think that also the momentum around more talk in, in among chefs about vegetarian food and making that the halo product. Again, I feel that's important. Um, I just got a couple of other questions though. I notice a lot of the pledges have been talking about talking about social media as a means to drive traffic and about recipe changes, not recipe changes, recipe instructions encouraging people. Do you really think? that people take any notice of these res recipe <laughs> suggestions on the size of packs or, 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 in, or on websites? I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm looking at you, though, Chris, first. Uh, yeah. um, what we do know is that consumers are looking for healthy twists and looking for inspiration. Um, we had some data from Australia, so it's not the UK, but data from Australia that showed that 90% of people were following the instructions on pack. So whilst the numbers might change across the different countries, I think it's, it's fair to say that people do read them, do follow them, and by updating those recipes, both on pack and online, you can make a big difference in inspiring those little changes that will make a big difference. Uh, Alec, sorry, you were... You... No, no, I was, I was just going to say, I think it, it does make a difference. If you, if you think about some of the things that have attracted a lot of um, noise on, on social media, things like avocados, you know, the, the, those types of products, you see massive increases in sales as soon as that, that happens. I mean, avocados, I think that they're up 40%. Um, in terms of sales um, in, in recent years. I mean, they've absolutely, absolutely been steamrolling. The other area, of course, is of people like celebrity chefs, um, which, um, you know, you just have to have Jamie do a, an advert or a, re, um, a, a recipe. A recent one was asparagus, if you, if you remember, and you see a massive surge in, in sales. So I think, you know, those avenues are really um, uh, fruitful when it comes to um, consumption of veg. What about hidden uh, veg as a challenge on Bake Off? Um, uh, sure. <laughs> I, I, one of the most incredible experiences was cooking a chocolate cake with courgettes and uh, a, ch a child who ate three portions of them we told him it had courgettes in and he looked really sick but he really enjoyed it until that moment but, so uh, why, why not why not a challenge to, to the Bake Off guys anyway um, and, uh, uh, any other questions another question yes. the lady here she's had a hold, hand up all the way through so sorry about that Oh, okay. We will get to. I promise you. I promise you. Can I have a microphone after there? Oh, there. Yes. Okay. Wherever the mic is, speak. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Francesca from Birdseye. Um, there is one thing. Um, if there is one category that is really the heart of frozen, basically in terms of the benefits that frozen can can bring, and if there is one category, one food category that can really benefit from frozen technology in a way, it's actually vegetables. Because vegetables, basically, frozen vegetables over-deliver in terms of waste reduction, for example. They over-deliver in terms of make it really achievable for consumers to, um, in terms of time and convenience and so forth, to really consume more often, more frequently vegetables. 
they help a lot in terms of basically bringing variety into diets because they reduce the impact, they kind of eliminate the impact of seasonality, bringing virtually fresh products into like across, across the year in, into, the, into the, the houses. Um, and of course, it over, it over delivers in, ter in terms of healthiness because basically um, frozen vegetables are picked at the moment when they're really ripe and when they're frozen, they basically lock in all the nutrients. So, so let, me, let me, yeah, what's the question? <laughs> I know about the benefit. My question <laughs> is, so given all this, there is one thing that is a real, still a massive barrier, uh, that is appeal. So the sexy element that was mentioned before. So my question is, because there is all this commitment to really pushing vegetables, and because frozen vegetables are, are this powerful, in terms of all the positive intent that I've heard uh, in, in this room, what are the retailers planning to do to make frozen vegetables, this powerful category basically, more appealing, more sexy, and attracting more consumers, and educating consumers towards this basically? Is there anything that you're planning to do about that? Anyone got anything on frozen? Um, yeah, thank you for your contribution. Um, <laughs> you're allowed to make a pledge as well, by the way, at Birdseye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're allowed I to. I think I've pretty much just done that. <laughs> Why don't, can I just, before you answer, I'm going to say something else. Why do peas, to me, is the ultimate convenience food? Mm. It is quicker to cook peas mm. than two minutes it takes. Why don't you celebrate the convenience of that? That's, that's faster than pasta. That's mm. faster than any other convenience food. Eight minutes to cook a pizza. It takes, and then you've got to get the oven up. Two minutes to do peas. It's fantastic. Why don't you celebrate convenience? Because it's pretty much intrinsic. What people don't know about peas is that they are so much more than convenience. They're well, really they are nutritious, so but what a brilliant, convenient yes. product. Talk about a win-win. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just I don't back. want to interrupt your personal um, discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the, the essence of, of uh, the conservation technique matters much less to customers once you get beyond convenience. So what you'll find most of the retailers, and certainly Tesco, doing is using freezing for a number of reasons that, that enhance the, the product quality. So there are, there are products that we sell, and we sell frozen simply because it's the best way of getting fruit and veg, usually veg, into consumers' pockets and, and, and into their baskets. And you're going to see more of that. And you'll see more of it, and I keep banging on about food waste, you'll see more of it because it also helps with food waste. So when we've got crop utilization issues, one of the great things that you can do, not just to benefit people's health, but to conserve the planet's resources, is to freeze the additional product, the additional crop, and it be utilized in that particular way. So I don't, you know, people are always writing off the frozen food industry, not me. I think it's got a lot of mileage in bringing innovation and creativity in a way that isn't just about convenience. It's also about quality and, and eating and taste. Very good. So the lady here, is there a microphone for the lady here? Because she had her hand up and I think she's given up on us. You haven't given up. <laughs> Don't give up. I've got the microphone here. Um, can I okay, can, I just, can you get the microphone from her and afterwards get, put it, give it to this lady? Because as I say, she's had it up all the way. I don't want to ignore her. Go on. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment about connection and short supply chains because, in my view, one of the most powerful ways to get children to eat vegetables is actually to get them growing the vegetables. And having shorter supply chains, such as community supported agriculture, farmers markets, community gardens, actually gets children and adults actually eating many more vegetables than just buying them in a shop. Possibly. <laughs> Well, no, no. I think that there's a, there's, you know, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the things that really appeals to, um, you know, the kids and the youngsters are, are things like meet the farmers. We we have, and I'm sure others have, kind of meet the farmers day, where the farmers are in stores. We have open farm Sunday. We 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 gave gave away packs of seeds. It's a really engaging way um, uh, of of you know of bringing in um, young you know youngsters into that connection with with the industry. Yeah. Absolutely right. Lady here. So my question is, regards to the pledges that have been made about um, promoting more vegetables, putting them to the front of the shops, etc., which is very good. But one thing I do find is that, whilst before it was mentioned that the vegetables itself are quite cheap, 
But if you, that's only when you buy them raw, you have to then take them home, you have to prepare them, you have to chop them up, you have to peel them, etc. But buying food that's vegetables that are already prepped is quite expensive. And if you want to make it more accessible, and um, we talked about convenience as well, then maybe having them already prepped and um, at a reasonable price might be a way of increasing that. And also, I know that sometimes it's a matter of knowing what to do with the vegetables once you buy them in terms of recipes, etc. Sometimes they do have a recipe at the back, but they only have one. So is there a way you could look at maybe having a few recipes so you can use it in this um, sense so that there's just more engagement in the terms of knowing what to do with the vegetables once you eventually buy them? I'll take that one. Um, I think that that's, has come over as quite a focus um, from many of us here via social media, via our websites, to really try and actually engage um, customers with the products and therefore with the recipes that they can... Um, that they can use so you know I've talked about education and having people kind of understand seasonality understand what to do with veg I think that plays a major focus and we talked again about social media earlier that is something that we really see as such a positive side um, to get the message out there be it recipes be it suggestions um, I mean I'm absolutely obsessed with looking at hashtag unicorn carrots on Instagram because people genuinely take pictures they show what they've done with them they they share them with their communities um, and that's something that I really think provides us with an opportunity not not just recipes but actually understanding vegetables and understanding what you can do with them and how you can incorporate them into breakfast or you can incorporate them into your snacking, you know, snack cucumbers, mini peppers, things like this. Are, are people just need to, to, to have that kind of forum where they can share that information because I think once that gets going, then, you know, we are a social media sort of network nation that that information can get around and we can help each other. It was interesting, though, wasn't it, when Tesco did the star-shaped uh, bits of squash using food waste, yeah. it was criticised because you weren't representing veg in their original form. So you're sort of damned if you do as well, aren't you? Well, I think it's like a thousand flowers bloom. So from our point of view, uh, if that introduces another family to the joy of that specific veg and those kids want it again and perhaps want to see the follow-up products which might be potato or carrot or whatever it is then if we've added some value and the supplier as a consequence has been able to minimize their food waste then you know who could argue with that nobody has lost out in that equation um, so we'll keep doing it Adam I think it's, it's absolutely vital mm. the economics of preparation you know if you've got a simple commodity like a potato customers can work out for themselves whether you've added enough value for the price to be right and we're constantly juggling between the real cost and the benefit and the return to the supplier and what the customer will pay for a specific amount of preparation and it varies by product it varies by product type it varies by the ability of the customer to pay so th there's a whole range of variables that all have to play in but also those pledges around including vegetables in meal deals is crucial, isn't it? Yeah. From a, because that lowers the, VAT, the, uh, the, the, the cost to the consumer. One last question. Who's got the mic? I, I've, I've got a mic. <laughs> Hello, person with the mic that I can't see. Oh, there you are. Um, so is that so right? We've got time for one last question, Sheila? Or can we keep going? <laughs> okay, one last. Yes, no. Uh, uh, one okay. last question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie Rice. I've worked with uh, Tower Hamlets to increase access to fresh fruit and vegetables in deprived areas. And there's been a lot of focus around healthy star vouchers. I see that several of the retailers have increased in their pledges to increase uh, the awareness of healthy star vouchers and the use of them. Um, but we know that so many of those vouchers are used on infant formula. Uh, and other products other than fresh fruit and vegetables. And I wondered how uh, the retailers uh, could incentivize mums uh, to consider using their Healthy Start vouchers, which is obviously a finite amount, uh, to actually redirect that spend onto using it for fresh veg for those uh, children who, as we've just said, are absolutely key to getting them to taste these products so young. You do healthy start vouchers, don't you? Yes, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, that's a it's a very good point, and I think that I, whilst I can't answer it immediately, we'll take back and look at what ways we can incentivise that. What one of the key things that we're looking at is is you know we've got 
so many colleagues at the coalface who can actually um, communicate um, what customers can actually do with those vouchers in store at the time that they're doing that. And so one of our key um, uh, pledges is actually um, to ensure our colleagues know what those vouchers can actually be used for so they can actually, you know, literally at that point um, uh, make that connection with the customer and say, did you know you can use it for fruit and veg? And we will be communicating that out to all of our colleagues um, uh, shortly. Well, that, as they say, is all we have time for. Thank you very, very much to our panellists for their super pledges and for the answering your questions as helpfully as possible. And thank you to Adam Leyland. Marvellously done. Um, we are about to have lunch, but beforehand, it turns out, as you can see from these flashing things, that we are trending on Twitter in London, and I'd like to encourage you to Twitter some more uh, so that we get to trend nationally, because after all, the lack of uh, vegetables in our diets is, an, is a national issue, uh, much more than it is a London one. So get on those, uh, get on your smartphones. Um, lunch, um, Apparently, this, is not, this wasn't a very well thought out building. A lot of you, and this will be really good for you, we're going to have to walk to the, to the gallery where lunch will be um, served. Some people can go in the lifts, but it would help greatly if we want to avoid the situation at the security desk um, if, we would, if so many of you would walk. Um, and find the veg ambassadors if, you want, if you're involved in some organization, food company, that you want to pledge next year because uh, they'd like to set up a meeting with you with the Peas Please team. And if you've got ideas, find a veg ambassador. Um, speakers and uh, chairs of panels, would you go to the gallery for a photo call at 12.15? Apparently it's there, okay? Uh, one o'clock, I'm sorry we've cut down your time uh, because we were having an intelligent discussion. Um, so back here at one o'clock for the announcement of the winner of the Veg Ad competition, and that's a frightfully glamorous event, so do be here. And uh, as I say, the lunch is on the top floor and it's a walk. Okay, see you back at one.